There's always a story behind a tool, a tool that you own or a tool that you're trying to fix so you can use it. Here we are, my brother and I again, trying to get a, a lathe that I found on the marketplace. In this case, I'm uh, just going to talk about the lathe and how I rebuilt it and it's now it's ready to go. Yeah, so I used to work at Western Auto from 1989 to 1996 by the time they closed all the stores or most of the stores because I found a store in Oklahoma that is still open. As you can see, I took a video of it and I was surprised to see my old Western Auto <laughs> there. Here's the shop that I used to work at. Here's my friends or my co-workers. And you can see the lathe that we had there, an Emco lathe to do the brake jobs. When I opened my own shop, I bought a lathe, the same one, and it worked real good. Here's my brother and I, younger. I sold that lathe, now I need it again, so I found one at the marketplace and I went to get it to Oklahoma, and as you can see, the lathe is not in a good shape. I had to take it all apart and clean all the pieces and components and replace whatever is replaceable, like the oil seals and the bearings on the motor, on the motor bearings. And then I can put it all together and make it good again for another 40, 50 years. These lathes are pretty good and very accurate. As long as you know what you're doing when you're turning it, you have to throw up the adapters and make sure they, they're through and that you clean the surfaces, the rotor hubs and, and drums so the piece sits properly to the adapter and then you can do an accurate cut. Cleaning, lubricating and painting delay to give it a better look and appearance. So I'm just gonna do a quick assembly. I didn't take videos when I was disassembling the lathe, but I took all the video footage for the assembly of the lathe. So that's what the videos all about. So I started cleaning by pressure washing the mainframe assembly and the electrical panel assembly. You can see the grease became solid and waxy with a lot of dirt and grime and rust on most of the lathe components. One of the first things that I did is to sand the rust away from the main spindle and the cross feed assembly, the motor mount shafts and the arbor, some of the adapters and the bearing seal cap. Here's most of the adapters that the lathe came with. Unfortunately, some of the adapters and the drum boring bar was missing when we arrived. Also, we're missing the shutter bar and the bracket, the range, the Amco big range. But overall, everything was there. One of the first things I wanted to fix was the electric motor, especially the bearings. So I went to Purvis Industries here in Dallas and got me a couple of bearings for the motor. Also, the wires were fried and brittle. So after cleaning all the motor parts, I proceeded to put it together, not before I made a new power cord with new connectors. Installing the bearing in the back plate and wiring the power cord to the centrifugal switch and attaching it to the back plate, indexing it and snapping it into the armature housing, covering it with the plate, then the capacitor, and cover, lubricating the centrifugal snapper and placing the armature to its casing. After installing the spring washer, the motor was assembled and ready to go. A little testing before mounting it to the mainframe. Forgot to clean the pulley though. That's better. Installing the motor bracket outside the casing and then sliding the motor mount shaft makes the job a lot easier. After receiving my parts, I then could install the belt to make the adjustments on the belt release assembly. I ordered the kit with all boots and brush washer and a few knobs, but I forgot to order the oil seals, so I had to get them locally. I was cutting the rear flange assembly gasket with the laser engraver. Meanwhile, I was installing the oil seal. I coat of grease and oil and will be ready for installation. Hone the cross slide bore to make smooth and ready to be looped. With my 12 mil motor brush, I did most of the cleaning or brushing. This machine ended up to be pretty useful for this kind of work. Variable speed, reversible, interchangeable with jack of shock. I love it. Now I'm removing the front oil seal, a little honing and installing the new seal. After my gasket is ready, glued to the back plate, it's time for installation. Mm, this is nice. Bellow booth in place, time for the front clamp, front ring or brass washer, insert clip or retainer. Honing the bar guide boards and installing the bar guide. It gets fastened through the bottom. Lubricating the crossfit boards and installing the crossfit assembly without forgetting the dust booth. Nice. Now the gearbox assembly. 
This is the variable drum feed gearbox assembly. These units are paint to put together, although the menu with exploded view will indicate the position of the pieces, does not tell you what to put together first or in what order. The point of this gearbox assembly is to vary the speed using a Belleville spring and compress two sheaves or conical washers, taper washers, sandwiched between the spring and the disc, kind of like a clutch. But you can force the clutch in and out of the conical washers to vary the diameter as a sheave but without the belts. It's an Emco trademark infimatic feed, so when you turn the dial, it changes the speed mechanically. Anyway, it's very hard to put together the first time. Although, once you figure it out, it's no big deal. This lead screw assembly, the only way I could put it together is, is holding the pieces with vinyl tape or electrical tape and removing the tape after it was assembled. There's a little spring and a couple of index clutches that need to be together to be installed with the rest of the gears and the clutch lever. The feed adjusting screw is ready to be installed along with the retainer and the dial. Now you can see how the mechanism works here. Lubricating the bearings and spindle extension to thread with the valve spring and cap. The miter gear and shaft go on the cover. This gear is for the crank handle or manual feed. A little more grease, bearing and adjuster or bearing lock. Finally, bolted together and ready to be mounted on the spindle. Don't forget the lead screw dust cover and clamping the pillow boot helps to assemble it easier. Screwing the lead screw at the same time that you tap the gearbox into place. Finally, secure with the set screw. Smooth operation. Don't forget the lead screw nut. Now it's better. Finally, the real clamps and the lock rod. This brake feed mechanism. This gearbox is not as complicated as the other one, but it does require some patience to assemble as well. The main thing here, that a roll pin holds both halves together, so it's a little tricky to remove and install to separate the halves. So after Permatex and greasing the gears is finally together. The assembly goes back into the main frame. The bottom two screws will hold a bracket for the rod that supports the anti-shutter pad, which I do not have at this time. Finally, the shifter handle. The drive housing is installed. First the pulley drive, then to install the housing, you have to loosen the belt pulley and move it inwards to be able to position the housing. Then bolt it down and move the pulley back to its place. Line up the motor pulley after. Finally the crossfit crank is installed, the knob and done. Well, at least this part. The electrical panel assembly. First, cleaning and inspecting the lamp, wires, receptacle and light bulb socket. Everything seems to be good except for the paper insulator, which I will replace with fish paper insulation. After installing new connectors, you have to be careful to identify which wire is going to be the neutral and attach it to the socket threaded part and the line to the center of the socket. Replacing the main power cord and properly grounding the lathe is a must. Follow the electrical diagram or a schematic. We are getting to the most satisfying part of the rebuild. Installing the belt cover and putting together the twin cutter. Using the thread mill wire brush makes cleaning the component a lot faster and easier. But to make them look like new, there's nothing like having a lathe. Where you can hold the pieces to sand or scrape so they look like new. Like the saying goes, any lathe is better than no lathe. Pulleys, cranks and dials look so much better when you rotate them to be clean. After putting all the components together, cleaning all the pieces, now it's time to remake the missing Emco sign. Since the whole sign was missing, I will use this bucket board that I took out of the treadmill and a smaller aluminum sheet metal plaque to make the sign. Final cut, transfer, done. Mounted on the bench, done. Now let me show you the proper way to machine rotors and drums. Lots of shops and places where these services are offered are supposed to do this, but you know, most of the time they don't do it. That is cleaning the mating surfaces that are going to be referencing a good geometrical plane to cut the rotor or drum, both on the lathe and on the car. I've seen rusted pieces machine, but the contact planes are rusted or with metal contaminants. These surfaces need to be pristine to eliminate vibration due to inappropriately mounted or inappropriately torqued rotors. You can see how this rotor is uneven and warped. But after a few passes and a final slow cut, this rotor is like new again. Of course, you have to make sure to measure to comply with the thickness tolerance or to be within specifications. Thanks for watching.